Welcome to the I Lit Wit Podcast, episode number three. I'm Dr. James Kundar. And I'm Dr. Len Hua. And we've brought to you today, as, as we have in previous two episodes, two timely issues in optometry and eye care that we are going to discuss for a brief time and give you our perspectives on it from the uh, sunny, beautiful campus of Pacific University College of Optometry. Yes, and today we're going to talk about, uh, yeah, floaters and 3D vision and eye strain. All right, well, let's start with floaters there, Len. And uh, please, again, don't use this as medical advice without consul- consulting your local eye doctor. Yes, so this is just uh, some interesting, uh, um, interesting literature kind of um, publication with some interesting wit that we draw from the literature uh, publication. So about vitreous uh, floater, this is published recently actually in the in American Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, the uh, key is that vitreous floater may uh, negatively affect uh, quality of life, especially for uh, younger patients with symptom. Let's just... So, uh, yes, so floater is very common in our... So, so as you, you know, James, floaters are very common in, in our patient population, right? You and I, I do have floater. I have some too, and some yeah. big ones. And the interesting finding was that they kind of, kind of uh, did a qu- questionnaire about like two or 300 uh, patients, and the average age about 53 years old, and check with them, say, for instance, like a, a gambling type of, of question, say, if you have surgery, and then you may uh, get ocular um, kind of complication from the surgical procedure, you may go blind. Will you go ahead and do the procedure to get rid of your floater? And mm. and and there was like a significant number of patients uh, say yes, they they would do it because they the floaters are so annoying. So what what are some of the way that that you can get rid of floater for your patient, James? Yeah, well, people are you know, you're right. I mean, all of us that are practicing eye care, I think even our students know that that floaters uh, are a common patient complaint. Uh, the the standard method of, of getting rid of floaters is only when vitrectomy is necessary and mm-hmm. and uh, you know a patient for example with diabetic retinopathy that has a, a vitreal hemorrhage uh, when the, they can't see out and we can't see in they they'll get the uh, the vitrectomy that that is a serious surgery and and runs the risk of retinal detachment of course we all know they replace the vitreous with saline and in the meantime they use a nitrogen bubble to hold the uh, retina in place but it's risky. Yeah, and so 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 most of the time, probably you would not uh, send the patient for surgery. Right? Most of the time, we would just just tell the patient, yeah, it's part of your eye. Uh, learn to get used to it. You will not be uh, like conscious aware of it as time passes, right? But then from this study, you say maybe we should pay pay uh, pay kind of a little bit more closer attention. If it is really annoying, there are a number of way that can be done at the moment. For instance, I, I don't know if you heard about like the yak thing, using the yak laser to shoot Yeah, the there, there are some uh, cowboy ophthalmologists that are trying to make yes. floaters, floaters smaller with uh, you know an outpatient surgery with the yak laser. Yeah, so instead of like one big floater, now you have hundreds of small floaters and hopefully your retina can adapt to it and not, not paying too much attention to it. I think that's the idea. Yeah, and yes. if there's any chance, although we know the vitreous doesn't circulate, if there's any chance through vitreous liquefaction that the uh, the smaller floaters will settle to the bottom somewhere with gravity, then uh, you you know, perhaps that will re- oh, decrease on a, Another interesting way that we're going to try is the floater pellet. Yeah, so uh, you know, as long as there are, are patient problems that they don't like our solutions to, there will be uh, alternative remedies. And I think we showed last time that Natural Ophthalmics is a co- company that makes a number of combination homeopathics for everything from men's and women's dry eye to ortho K, daytime and nighttime, uh, you know, types of uh, both eye drops and homeopathics. And they, they make allergy things and they make a floater pellet, which uh, we have here and it make a good sound effect. So I'm going to shake the bottle a little bit. Now, those are the, um, the little round uh, spherical sugar pills. They, they uh, put the homeopathic remedy on. Now the homeopaths I talked to, uh, I should go to the next uh, slide, um, well, I guess not just yet. But the uh, homeopaths I talked to talk about uh, in combination homeopathics are not the way to go. There's not a homeopathic remedy for floaters or anything else. Uh, nor it, it's, a, it's a remedy instead that should be obtained by doing an extensive case history with the patient. So they would do, uh, if you and I came in with the chief complaint of floaters to someone mm-hmm. practicing mm-hmm. homeopathy, mm-hmm. and it could be a naturopathic doctor who's gone to graduate school or it could be uh, uh, someone who hasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen them, people who run health food stores, you know, do, mm-hmm. do the workup. And they, mm-hmm. 
And uh, we, they would take an extensive case history on you and I for 45 minutes. And with mm -hmm. the same chief complaint, they'd come up with uh, different remedies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it would be a single homeopathic remedy to, to solve what, what ails us. Mm -hmm. And it works sort of on the principle, if you want to if you want to try to apply hard science to it, I guess, you know, that's not really the way it works. But the, 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 uh, on the principle like vaccines work, that like cures like, and a small amount of the inoculum will eliminate the complaint. Mm -hmm. So now this, this, this one from uh, floater pellets from natural thalamics, and that floater pellets is what they're called, uh, have a combination homeopathic, and they use the Latin to talk about the, the dilution and things, but um, we've got things, everything from the mineral, minerals, phosphorus and silica, um, to, uh, to sulfur and phosphate, um, and there are a couple other ingredients, but they're diluted down to one billionth or one trillionth um, dilution, which, you know, of course is uh, not guaranteed to have even a single molecule of the original mother tincture, as they call it. So, James, uh, uh, we are by in no means uh, promoting the product or anything. It's just something interesting. You have a photo pellet, so I say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm willing to go along with it. We're going to just take, take a photo pellet and see what happens. So, we're going to take some and, now? And yeah, I'm going to take one. You, okay, we're breaking the rules because we're, we're touching them, Lynn. I'll let okay, you know that okay. the homie pass say that if you touch it, it loses its power. But I'll put it on my tongue and there it goes. All right. Well, it tastes, tastes like a sugar pill. It does. Yeah. It mm -hmm. does indeed. We should not so, underestimate the power of the sugar so pill. So as, as we say, in more of a mainstream is that you can have floaterectomy, yak laser. Uh, you already mentioned a uh, vitrectomy. So uh, the bottom line is that actually if your, your patient do have floater, or something, pay a little bit more closer attention to it. Maybe if uh, they need to, to, to have kind of referral for four for like surgical intervention, um, maybe they may benefit from it. So so don't just say, okay, go home. There's nothing to do about it, and and you can get used to it. So so uh, that's that's the gist of the study. I think floaterectomy. I like that. Yeah. Okay. All next, right. So on to our, our technological topic. Uh, the, 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 here we have uh, in our our Spider Man slide. I uh, wanted to chat a little about uh, about three D vision displays a little mm -hmm. bit more. Hot topic mm -hmm. right now in the news. So I, I've been reading about about concerns. You know, I think it started with the um, the handheld Nintendo uh, DS, that, that's a 3D display, that there was a concern from Nintendo's chairman uh, saying that children under a certain age should not use the device mm -hmm. just in case they mm -hmm. were to have problems in perceiving real 3D in the world. Um, hard to talk with a sugar pill in your mouth, huh? <laughs> so <laughs> <I'm way chewing. laughs> so uh, uh, anyway, uh, there's, there's some allegation that at least, maybe not so much on 3D movies in the theater where accommodative um, demand is negligible. But in, uh, in near 3D displays in particular, where uh, the accommodative distance is less than six meters, particularly when it's less than four meters and you have a quarter diopter or more of accommodation in play, on the, uh, so on a laptop or a computer or uh, you know, a handheld game, the, uh, the difference between the accommodative demand of the screen and the convergence demand, the convergence demand, uh, which, is, which is somewhere out in front of the screen when a 3D image is showing, might be significant. So, you know, we all know that these are logarithmic scales, and as, as if you have a vergence demand at, at 35 centimeters and a, a, a accommodative demand of 40 centimeters, you don't have a match between those two systems. Mm -hmm. And if it gets outside of Panem's fusional area, then you might end up with what has been coined as uh, the term binocular dysphoria. Oh, is it, is it similar to eye strain? Well, that's the that's the thought is that if, okay. if accommodated the plane of accommodation the plane of virgins don't match that that eye strain may result in least certain of our patients. So then, what's 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 possible solution to this? So what we're investigating right now in our in our three D vision clinic soon to open this month in in Beaverton, Oregon, is uh, is using prisms and glasses, for example, uh, or possibly vision therapy to vision in order therapy. to, to relieve. Okay. But you know, I gotta gotta say personally, I'm a little skeptical. Um, on whether if somebody comes in with symptoms in a 3D movie in the theater mm -hmm. where uh, accommodation and virgence are, are nearly zero, that, that vision therapy is going to be a big benefit to them because I'm, I'm guessing a lot of these patients are going to have vertical heterophoria or divergence insufficiency and conditions that are not particularly responsive to vision so you, therapy. So you say prism may be more effective. Yeah, if you have a basic esophore or basic exophore, who gets symptoms in a 3D movie theater? It's it's a great screening tool in that regard. But you know, I, I happen to follow the literature in regard to these things, and, and it doesn't seem like phorias are changeable with with use of vision therapy and, and anything but false convergence insufficiency or due to age or due to surgery. So then, this is kind of interesting 
does does that mean that the kind of the three D glasses industry should look into it, design some adapt type of thing? Well, that's the beauty the... of it. But Gunner Optics and Marshawn and some of the uh -huh. other optical companies have already come out with with prescription three D glasses, so you can get your for the passive three D theaters that don't use the flicker glasses. You can get your prescription, including Prism, put into the glasses. You don't have to wear two pairs. You wow. stack them. And uh, they possibly could double as sunglasses when you go outside. Interesting yeah. feel. So that's, uh, that's what's coming. I'll let you know as we try these out on patients starting yes. at the end of the month. Yes. And probably I, w I should try it too if, if I do. Especially if you have symptoms. 3D. I, yes. How, okay. how, how well do you see 3D at the theater, Len? Pretty good, I Be think. Better than I do? I don't know. We should yeah. go and compare. Maybe we'll have yes. an episode of Before the Movie Starts next time. Sure. Okay. So next two topics. For next week, uh, it looks like uh, some capsular fibrosis going on in IOL there, huh? And, and this is a common problem too. So I think there's actually some new new design that will try to eliminate this from happening. So so then maybe you don't need yet capsulotomy at all in the future. That would uh, probably not make the surgeons happy, but uh, probably make the patients pretty happy. It's true. And another thing is maybe getting rid of myopia too. Well, I don't know if we can get rid of it, but uh, the the question Slow is, you know. The, 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 <laughs> we're always interested in slowing the progression of myopia, particularly if uh, those of, of us like, like myself who have little ones and there's myopia on both sides of the family. Yes, yes. Uh, but you know, the, the only proven method, I think, uh, is, is uh, the cruel-to-be-kind method where you, you dilate the kids' eyes every day and give them sunglasses and reading glasses during their growing years. And that might be for a decade or more. Yeah. So we'll talk a little about the uh, use of the good old belladonna alkaloid atropine for myopia control. Cool. I like the topic. Very common. So... Until next time. Yeah, that's the end of Eyelid Wit episode number three. I'm Dr. James Kundart. I'm Dr. Lenoir. And we'll see you online. Okay, Andrew.